In the year 2000, I was aged 15. I dropped out of high school and became basically homeless, couch surfing and living rough. Now, you've probably all heard the expression that you need to hit rock bottom before you can bounce back. For me, this was absolutely the truth. And amazingly, being a 15-year-old homeless high school dropout was not my rock bottom. It got worse, much worse. I'll get to my rock bottom soon. I won't say too much about it now, just two things. It involved senior police officers and a bag of donuts. Now, my story gets a little dark at times. So to give you assurance that there is a positive ending, I'll also say that by the year 2010, at the age of 25, I became the youngest ever CEO of a YMCA in Australia. And it's this story of transformation from rock bottom to where I am today that I'm here to share with you. I'll start at the beginning. My life started tough, and it got tougher. I was born in regional Queensland, Australia, to a Swedish man called Lars and an English woman called Catherine. By the time I was two, they'd divorced, and Catherine and I had been kicked out of the big tin shed that I'd been born in. I didn't see Lars again until my mid-30s. Although I'm sure that Catherine did her best as a single mother, she also suffered from se severe mental health issues, which meant that she was institutionalised and treated until she was deemed well enough to return and continue mothering. And during these times, in the absence of both of my biological parents, I was put into short-term foster care. Now, some people that do foster care are amazing. It's obvious they're there for altruistic reasons. And some of the families I lived with were like something out of a fairy tale, the Brady Bunch even. These were amazing times. However, there's also people in foster care who are not there for the right reasons. These people should not be allowed to care for vulnerable young people. My mother would always return, and nothing would be spoken of until it happened again. Her frequent mental health breakdowns combined with many unhealthy relationships meant that we moved around a lot. My childhood was filled with changes to schools, social networks, and homes. And by the time I was 13, although I naturally loved school, education, and learning, the turbulence of my home life had affected me. I started skipping school, smoking, and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Aged 15, the principal of the high school that I occasionally attended said, Jessica, you have two options here today. You can leave of your own accord or be expelled. I chose the former. Now, the real downward spiral starts when one of my best friends hangs in and kills himself, aged just 17. He was a victim of child sexual abuse and unfortunately just never recovered. This is one of the reasons why I've chosen the career that I have and advocate for the safety and well-being of young people. So, this is where my rock bottom comes up. 2003, picture me. Sun-kissed, strawberry blonde ringlets, splattering of freckles across my face. I'm already over six foot tall and basically looking like a walking advertisement for Surf Life Saving Australia. I was working full-time at Donut King, and no, Donut King is not my rock bottom, <laughs> despite the fact that the hot pink uniform clashed horrendously with my strawberry blonde hair. <laughs> After about six months, I'd been promoted to the salubrious role of morning shift manager. Mm. I was also completing my high school certificate, doing night courses at TAFE, which is an alternative educational institute. I thought that I was doing okay until 11 a.m. one morning, two senior police officers from the Crime Information Bureau showed up at my workplace. And they were there to arrest me, not get their morning snack. So, if the letters CIB do not strike terror into your heart, you need to understand that these guys are like the Australian drug-busting version of the FBI. They mean business, and if they knock on your door, something serious has gone down. So here I am, looking at two of the largest, scariest coppers that I have ever seen. These guys are fully cut out. They're wearing bulletproof vests. They're armed with guns and tasers, whilst I 
am armed with a hot pink visor and a bag of cinnamon donuts. <laughs> Despite my very persuasive negotiations, including attempts at bribery, these two would not be persuaded. They were adamant that, no, I could not finish my shift, and yes, I must attend the police station with them right then and there. When I got to the police station, I was charged with drug trafficking and supply to an undercover police officer. Turns out I was target number 21 on an undercover sting that the, the, that the department had set up in Queensland to bust the drug trade at the time. Now you're probably wondering how I got here. Flashback to finding my best mate hanging from a tree when I was aged only 15. That two-year downward spiral included me moving in with the love of my life, <laughs> Sean. Sean also suffered child abuse. And throughout our relationship, he used drugs daily, and he was also physically and emotionally violent. This is something that I still wear the scars for today. <laughs> Sean was number four on that target list. He'd been introduced to Russell, the very vanilla, nondescript-looking boyfriend of his bikey-tattooing, homebrew-making, cocaine-snorting, Centrelink welfare-rorting mother, Kerry. Turned out, Russell was not actually Kerry's boyfriend. He was, in fact, an undercover police officer. By the time I was arrested, Sean had been supplying him with a range of narcotics for over six months. Yes. Following my arrest, I was on bail for almost a year. During this time, they took away my passport and I had to sign in at the local police station weekly. I didn't tell anyone what was going on, let alone ask for advice. I actually don't know who I would have asked. There really just wasn't anybody. Finally, I got my day in Supreme Court. I stood there wearing the only suit that I owned, and I was terrified, shaking. Not because I thought there was any chance that I would be sentenced to serve hard time, but because I had lied to my employer when I was taking a sick day. In fact, I thought that if the process was efficient, and why wouldn't it be, then I could go back to work that afternoon. <laughs> I had a uniform in the car outside the courthouse. How wrong I was. <laughs> Despite the fact that I had a clean record, I was working full-time and studying, the judge on the day decided to make an example of me. My stubbornness and misguided loyalty to Sean meant that I refused to give any statements about Sean or any of the other targets higher up the hit list than myself. This certainly didn't help my case. <sighs> I was sentenced to two years in maximum security prison. A sentence that I served in full at the Brisbane Women's Correctional Centre. Now, the stories that I have and lessons that I've learned during my time in prison could fill another dozen TEDx talks. Today, I'll just say this. That going to prison was the best thing to ever happen to me. Because... For the first time in my life, I had adult women around me who cared, who supported, who mentored, and who told me that I could do better than I was. Never underestimate the impact of a positive role model upon the life of a young person. Prison is a lonely place, but it's also a place where you have a lot of time to reflect and think. And I've always been a person that involves, that enjoys time to think and reflect. I also enjoy working my way through extreme challenges, something that's relevant to the CEO role that I do today, provided I have the opportunity to plan my way to get through it. One of the first pieces of advice that I received whilst in prison was, the books that you fill your mind with and the people that you surround yourself with today will decide the person that you are five years from here. I think this is true. So, I started by envisioning the person I wanted to become, 
what I wanted to be known for, the impact I wanted to have upon the people, the community, and the world around me. I was basically developing version one of my personal purpose and vision statement. Not that I knew this at the time. So the purpose and vision was the easy part for me. I knew the best thing I could do with my life was to have a positive impact on young people at a large scale. The values to drive my behaviour and decision making along the way were a little bit more difficult and they've taken longer for me to embed. However, I've always appreciated courageous honesty in people. I genuinely believe without facing the full truth first, you can't influence genuine change in yourself or the world around you. Inclusion is also at my core and always has been. All people deserve opportunities. They deserve a seat at the table and to have their voice heard. Right. I had my personal purpose, vision and values. I next set about finding people who reflected these values, whose behaviours demonstrated what I wanted to see in my future self. I also actively avoided people who showed behaviours that were in contrast with the person I wanted to become. This approach served me really well during my prison sentence. I also read books constantly. I absorbed as much as I could. Successful stories about politicians, leaders, CEOs, sports stars, books about sports game strategies, organisational management, anything that included processes for improvement. In fact, I read my way through most of the prison library's non-fiction section within two years. The common theme that I saw in all of these books, the real success stories, were that the leaders had a strategic plan and that's where they started. And these strategic plans had five key elements. They had a vision for where they were going. They had a purpose for why they wanted to go there. The values to drive behaviours and decision making. Clear goals. And the success measures to know if they were on track with their strategic plan. This all made a lot of sense to me and I wanted to apply it. But you have to remember that at the time, I was not a successful CEO. I was, in fact, a 19-year-old with over 12 hours a day alone in a concrete cell. The only initiative or organisation that I had to develop a plan for was myself. So that's exactly what I did. 2005, I'm released into what seems like an entirely new world. The complete lack of support and reintegration was a shock to me. Imagine going from a place where you have little to no choice, where people are telling you where to be, what to do, what to eat, what to wear, every minute of the day, to the real world, where you have to constantly make decisions for yourself. This is really tough, and I believe one of the key reasons why many ex-prisoners return to the known safety of incarceration. Australia's recidivism rate was over 60% in 2019. Amazingly, I was in the minority. And I genuinely believe this is through my planning and commitment to that process. Now, my plan had priorities. It did not state that I wanted to become a CEO. It didn't say even what sector or industry I wanted to work in. However, it did clearly articulate the following priorities, that I would have a positive impact on the lives of young people and advocate for child safety. It also said that I would stay committed to challenging myself, my learning, my personal growth, and I would maintain health and fitness. Now, over the past 20 years, my strategic plan has evolved. I now use a modified version of the Kaplan and Norton's balanced scorecard approach. And although I have this plan down to memory, I still go through an annual process of review, or more often if I start to feel lost, or if I have a major decision to make and I'm not quite sure which way to go. I find the process of review and planning not only refocuses, but re-energises me when I have challenges. Now, I understand many people would say, sure, I set goals too. And that's great. Goals are really important as part of a plan. In business, 
We all know that a strategic plan requires much more than goals to succeed. For what is a goal without those other four elements? The vision, the purpose, the values, and the success indicators to know if you are succeeding. So knowing this, why don't we all apply the same processes to our personal lives? We are the most important initiative that we will ever lead. And realistically, the only one that we will have full control of. I wonder if it's because we're not paid to do our own personal strategic plan, because we don't have a boss busting our chops or a manager giving us deadlines, a board of directors to help to facilitate the process. I would certainly hope that not all of us need to spend two years in a maximum security prison to take a bit of time for planning. Today, 2022, I am proud to be the CEO of Scouts Western Australia, an organisation that also recognises the importance of child safety and creating opportunities for young people to reach their full potential. I'm also a non-executive board director, I volunteer regularly, and I still teach three to four fitness classes a week. Yes, I am killing it. <laughs> this surround, this combined with the amazing people that I surround myself with today. This is the success indicator. This is the success measure and the indicator that my strategic plan is being achieved. So I'm here today sharing my story for the first time with the hope that some of it resonates. Maybe you feel encouraged or inspired to start your own strategic plan, develop a review process that works for you. Because I know it is this plan and my commitment to it that means I will never hit that rock bottom or go anywhere near it ever again. Yeah. <laughs>